Lauren Davis on RAP. I will explain RAP, reproducible analytical pipelines, faster, more robust, and more transparent analytical processes. Thank you very much, Warren. Hello. So, quick show of hands first. Um, who's heard of RAP before? Good, lots of you. Who currently works in a RAP way? Not bad. All right, hopefully more after this. Uh, so I'm part of the data science team at NHS England. This is our merry band up here. And specifically, I'm part of the RAP team. So my job is in this team, and as, as a team, is to work with another team to help them take one of their processes that may be done very manually and rebuild it in line with RAP principles so that it's more automated and faster. Uh, so RAP overall is a way of working. It's a, a set of tools, principles, and techniques that'll help you make your analytical processes faster, more robust, and more transparent. So I'm gonna go through some of those principles, uh, sort of the how of it, and then at the end I'll go through the, uh, sorry, this is the what of it, and then I'll go through the how of it at the end, how you put those principles into practice. So automation is the first one, and probably the key one. Anything that you do manually is going to be time consuming, costly, prone to human error. And if you automate that, you're going to free up that time. To do that, you're going to have to rebuild your process in code. Um, we recommend using open source programming languages like R, Python, because uh, they're free for one thing, they're flexible, support communities online, as well as in NHS, NHSR community, PyCom. And if you're using code, you're gonna want to use Git as well. So Git, show of hands, who uses Git on their coding projects? Oh, good. Yeah, Git, if you don't know, is a version control software. It helps you avoid situations like this, where you've got a file and you wanna make some changes to it, and yeah. <laughs> uh, you can roll back your changes, you can branch out and do crazy experiments, and if it doesn't work out, you can roll back, so it gives you disaster recovery as well. Uh, now a bit about how you actually write the code itself. So you're gonna write your code in modular blocks, which we call functions. Uh, rather than the first way when you first start learning coding is you have a big script and you write all your code on one page. Better ways to break it up into blocks and each function, each block, will take some input from the previous one and pass it to the next one. So you end up with a chain of functions leading from your source data to your final output, whether that's a report or another data set or whatever. Uh, lots of advantages for this. It makes your code more reusable, uh, helps other people use your code, helps you use other people's code, because if, you're, if someone else has got a function that does something you need to do, easier for you to airlift it into your project. Other advantages too, which I'll come back to in a sec. Uh, peer review. So another advantage of Git is that it can enforce peer review on your project, because if you're automating something, yes, you remove the manual error that you might experience because we're all human. But if you get it wrong, then you've automated something that's wrong. You're gonna be wrong every time. So you need to put steps in place to ensure that you're getting it right. One of them is just peer review from your colleagues. With Git, you can enforce this, as I say. Any change, you can make it so that any change to the code base, it just won't let you make the change unless another person has approved it. But we can go a step further, which is to use automated testing. So like I said before, we've broken our code into functions. Now functions are gonna give you the same output for any given input, unless you're doing something fancy like random numbers or something like that. So we can take advantage of this to create automated tests. We can give our function a certain input and uh, we know what the output should be, so we can test the output that it gives us versus the correct output. And if it's correct, then we can say that that function works and passes our test. All right, so this is the how section. So this is how do we put those into practice on a process that we already have that isn't currently using them. This is from the angle of the RAP team. So we're going in to help another team, but even if I was doing this myself, and I would follow this same process. First step is skills assessment. So who are you working with? What skills do they already have? Do you have people who know some coding? Do you have people who already know about Git? where are the gaps and create a training program to fill the gaps and also just the get your ducks in a row logistically with data access, which you know, it can take a while, can it? access to platforms and so on. 
then before you even write a single line of code, map out the current process. So basically, you're just making a flowchart, start to finish. This helps you in a few ways. It helps you because it helps you get your head around the process for one, but it also helps you figure out which bits of your process are, are you going to be able to turn into functions. And also, it's just really good documentation so that when if someone else joins the team, they'll be able to get their heads around it more quickly as well. And again, before you even start a single line of code, plan out what we call the thin slice. So this is, the temptation might be to start at the beginning of the project, the, the data source and work step by step to the end. We found a better ways to take one thin slice end to end, which might be just producing one statistic or one number from your report. That way, by the time we move off to and leave the team by themselves, everyone on the team, or at least someone on the team, has had exposure to all the different parts of the process, importing data, processing data, exporting data, transforming data. So the, all the steps are there on the team, and they're in a better place to pick it up from when we leave. Now you can start writing code. So this is the scaffolding approach, which is we've identified the functions that we need. We've set up a Git repository. Now we can put empty functions in. This is a nice way to ease people in if it's their first step into programming. Uh, they don't have to worry about where do I put this function and what file does it go in. It's all there for them. And you can even write doc, doc strings for them if you want. And then you just actually get to work. You've, you've done your pro process map, you've done your scaffolding, now you can flesh out all your functions and put into place all the good practices that we had before, the, uh, the code reviews, setting up unit tests for everything and having a good um, agile workflow as well. Once you've done that, then you can start expanding. So you've got that one number, that one statistic, you've got something that you can click and run end to end. Now you can flesh out the rest and fill out the rest of your report. Final step is to publish your code. Put your hand up if you publish your code. Very nice. <laughs> the rest of you, this is what we don't have because of you flying cars. <laughs> Um, we're a public sector organization, so we should publish our code. We should be transparent about how we're arriving at our statistics. But also it's good for us as well because it gets more eyes on our code, more people can spot mistakes, and more people can use our code in their projects as well. And that's it from him. Thank you very much. Um, in your experience working with teams, who are the most resistant to wrap, or oh, I should also say, questions on Slido, just to remind people, 3716942, I'm going to repeat the question. In your experience working with teams, who are the most resistant to wrap, and how do you overcome this resistance? Okay, no hard questions. <laughs> it's, um, I think some of the resistance is when you've used an old, a certain tool for a long time like Excel or something, and you know it very well. And there is a learning curve to things like Git and to R and Python. You're not going to hit the ground running at the same speed as if you'd used Excel. So there is a temptation to just use the, the thing that you know. So the way around that is, is carrot and stick approach. You can say, how much time are you spending on the project? And you can just do the maths on this. Like, OK, we could spend three months rebuilding this and training you up, but at the end of that, you've got something that runs in one hour instead of one week, and then you, you, you freed up that time to do something else. Do you find issues with going down rabbit holes in terms of perfecting the wrap and dealing with unforeseen issues? Yes. <laughs> um, there's a, a trade-off to how perfect you want to make something. Because we usually work with a team for, like I said, a few months at a time. And how do you make something absolutely pristine in three months or, and spend a lot of time refactoring it? Or do you make something less complete that, or more complete but is less perfect? And I lean towards the latter because I, I like the philosophy of make it work, make it right, make it fast. Like build something that just gets the right result, then optimize it for speed and refactor it so it's more readable and, and so on. I, I prefer that approach. Does a wrap pipeline need to be understood by one person from end to end, or can many people be involved who only know their part? 
yeah, it's, it's ideal if, if, if you're working with a team that everyone knows it because then you have more redundancy if people leave and so on, that's a risk. If, if you split it up and you have one person who only knows one part of it and that person leaves, then you, you kind of have, you're in a bit of trouble. You have to train someone else up. So it's good to have a bit of redundancy there. You can't always manage it in, in the real world. Just remind everybody again, slido.com on 3716942. You can ask questions, but also upvote your favorite questions that are coming through thick and fast. Um, I've lost track. Implementing this seems like a lot of work and time investment. Does this save time overall? Yeah, you have to do the maths. It's, um, you have to think about how much time. There's, um, you could do, I think there's an XKCD comic about this where it's got the, the chart of how much time you spend on it and uh, yeah you have to think about that like how if you have three people doing on something they do two days a week and that publication's not going anywhere then if you spend if you're on it full time for a month you I'm not going to do the math now but you can you can figure it out you can work out how much time do I need to invest in this is it to to save the time that I would save once it's automated does your support from your team only extend to NHS England teams? Uh, no, we do some uh, outreach stuff. We, we would only work with teams uh, within NHS England, but we, we do other, other things too that, to outreach like, like this. Uh, we have a website, which if you search for uh, NHS RAP, you'll find it with the first or second result. How do you pick up who to work with? Do you approach them? Uh, initially, the RAP team did approach people, but now uh, within the organization, we're kind of well-known and, and people come to us. We're kind of rock stars, really. Um. Will RAP be expanded to look at improving the use of infrastructure, for example, moving pipelines from being run locally to being run on the cloud? Um, yeah, I think we're, a lot of it's going that way. Um, so, like, we're not data engineers, so we're not getting involved with infrastructure decisions, but you, it, within NHS England, you kind of just have to go where the data is and you, you're locked into that. How do you ensure maintenance of the functions, packages within the RAP? Yeah, so this is going back to the principles before of uh, unit testing and, and having tests out, but even tests themselves need maintenance. So this is why, uh, like the the, the RAP engagement when we're working with the team is not just about changing the process. I mean, it's really about training them up so that when we leave, they'll be able to do the maintenance afterwards. How have you moved teams from just automating to full RAP? Often a script is created, it does the job, and then it just gets left. Yeah, so we have levels of RAP, which we're aiming for. We've got baseline, silver, and gold. And it's very rare that we go all the way up to gold, which is a, like a fully packaged uh, product. Uh, but like, a lot of times, you don't need to. Like, it's, it's just a lot of extra work for not a lot of benefits. And if you can automate something, then that's a lot of time saved. That's good enough. Biggest difficulties in implementing a pipeline? For example, training, infrastructure, et cetera? Infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dealing with the platforms can be a, a, a difficulty and uh, sometimes you have to do some workarounds. That's the end of the questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for those questions. A round of applause. Thank you.